Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now you may remember this Alienware from last summer. Sorry for getting a little Alienware obsessed lately. It featured an i7-920 CPU, a GTS 240 graphics card and 9 gigs of RAM. It had certainly been messed about with since it rolled off the production line, but everything still worked as it should, though it was however a pretty poor performer thanks to the weak GPU, one of which had been removed at some point, and the mismatched memory. Now since that video, I've sold most of the internal components over time, but kept the case as it was too big to post. In fact, I was always in two minds about letting it go. So, for months I've had a chassis lying empty, gathering dust and taking up space in the office. Or my bedroom. That's, that's what I mean, bedroom. That ended today when I built a new PC inside of it. Now if anyone from Dell is watching, don't worry, I won't try and sell this online as an Alienware or anything like that. This idea was simply just a result of curiosity. I wanted to see if you could use different components inside one of these old beasts. There were a few things to think about. Could the power supply handle different parts? Were there any proprietary connectors that only worked with the OG board? Will everything fit? And most importantly, will all the lighting work? Well, the first concern of mine was put to rest immediately when I discovered that the PSU was an 875 watt 80 plus silver unit with enough power connectors to run any card, modern or otherwise. You could probably power a street with this thing. As well. It's a custom size, I think, but there was no need to consider replacements as it still worked just fine. As you can see, it was necessary to opt for a micro ATX board here. A big case like this looks as though it could accommodate something bigger, but it's actually quite tight on the inside. Luckily, we also have embedded standoffs for the board to sit on, so I didn't need to fiddle around with those. I've used the stock cooler here as well. A small liquid cooler would fit, but to be honest, I'm not really a fan. I just wanted to let you know it is possible in case you wanted to undergo a similar project. So let's talk about this little secondary board or daughter board. It looks complex, but it's actually the board that controls the lighting for the chassis. This was a concern initially because I wasn't sure if you could just plug everything in from here to a new main board and get it working. If I was going to build a PC inside an Alienware case, I wanted that iconic yellowish hue emanating from the sides at least. It turns out that this mini board is powered by a Molex cable, of which we had plenty, and a standard USB cable connects it to the mother motherboard, any motherboard, and after putting everything together and wiring it in, it all lit up. I've read that some people have managed to install the Alienware command center and customize the lights, but I had no such luck. The color does match the yellow light on the motherboard though, so I don't mind, I quite like this color scheme. Furthermore, this is hit or miss, apparently. The lights won't work on all replacement motherboards, and even with this one, they do go out on occasion. The cool thing is, is that they always come back on when I start a game, so that's a nice feature, or glitch, or a bit of dodgy wiring on my part. But let's take a step back and talk about the new components inside of this setup. Unfortunately, a local PC shop is shutting down, so I was able to grab a few bargains on some unopened hardware. They are opening up again exclusively online in a few months though, so that's good. I managed to snag a 6-core Ryzen 5 2600X for £100, an Asus B450MA motherboard for 45 and a GTX 1660Ti for 200 the 1660 Ti is a little faster than the Super, much better than the non-Ti, and it only requires one 8-pin connector. This Zotac version is also pretty compact in size as well, making it ideal for our small space. I paired these parts with my 16 gigs of 3200MHz DDR4 and a 1TB SSD which had to find a new home down this gap as there are no dedicated bays for one. I guess that's a downside of older cases, no SSD bays and no front USB 3 ports. I also gave this thing a thorough clean before installing everything. The loose plastic bits were treated to a warm bath and the rest of the case got a scrub with a microfiber cloth. It was pretty filthy, but it was only really loose dust. 
As it turns out then, it's pretty easy to build a PC inside one of these Alienware Aurora ALX chassis, and with a little luck, the lighting will work as well. What's more is that there are plenty of connectors on the original power supply, and plenty of space for traditional hard drives should you want to go down that route. The dust-ridden case lives to see another day. So let's talk more about the components and test some games. Starting with the 2600X and for a CPU, I feel it's still a great choice and the 2600 non-X is even better. At this price point it's also worth considering the 1600, the new AF version of course because it's essentially a 2600 in disguise and costs less. The 2600X here will handle any gaming needs or rendering tasks with relative ease, and it should be good for a while. Plus it's quite a bit cheaper than the 3600 though, if you want to spend a little more you can expect better performance from that as well. The 1660 Ti is pretty much a 1070 replacement, albeit with 2 less gigs of memory, and a used 1070 may be better thanks to the lower price and extra VRAM, but at the moment a 1660 Ti or 1660 Super is a great choice for anyone looking at mid-range solutions you can still buy new. The Zotac Ti version can be found for the same price of some 1660 Supers, but will perform a little better. A little more money will get you a 2060 or 5600 XT though, so keep all that in mind. The 1660 Ti is a card I don't think I've had any past experiences with, and so far, for 1080p, it seems like a great choice to exceed 60 frames per second in all games. And speaking of which, we must now move on to said games, starting with Red Dead Redemption 2. Now this is a funny one in terms of performance, given the fact that it may drop 10 to 20 frames should you turn on a certain setting. Now I followed a couple of guides here and was able to achieve at least 60 frames per second, with things mostly set to high. A couple of things were turned down to medium, um, but there are plenty of guides online that will help you achieve 60 frames per second and still have the game look fantastic so the 1660 Ti is more than capable of 60 FPS even as we move toward Valentine got closer to the busy town the frame rate still remained very steady indeed and so far so good with this setup even the super demanding Assassin's Creed Odyssey ran with the very high preset at 63 frames per second on average. The 1% and 0.1% lows were 51 and 41 respectively. So again, it's pretty decent performance from that game. Now, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, much like Origins, enjoys a lot of CPU cores. So the more cores, the more threads, the better. And this shows with this benchmark test here. Actual gameplay will differ performance wise but you should expect at least 60 frames per second with this combination at the very high settings. The same can be said for Battlefield 5, it likes a good CPU, at ultra settings it ran with 89 frames per second with 1% and 0.1% lows of 60 and 43. I always play this uphill level because I find it particularly demanding on the CPU and here it ran absolutely fine. Battlefield 5 is a game that looks really really good and performs quite well as well providing you have enough threads under the hood of your system. Now this is a bit older, but I couldn't resist testing Crisis 3. Some may consider it a PC melter here with the very high settings and one times SMAA, we were seeing 89 frames per second on average. If I turned anti-aliasing all the way up, I have no doubt we would drop below 60. It's still a very, very demanding game indeed. 61 and 40 were the percentile figures there. So again, it's particularly impressive. Now I usually have trouble with this part here. This part seems to just tank the frame rate on some systems, but everything was remaining pretty steady using this configuration, which is good. Now Kingdom Come Deliverance with the very high settings, not quite the ultra high settings because that made us drop below 60, but the game itself says that that is intended for future hardware and I have no doubt regarding that statement. 71 FPS was the average here. The percentile figures were looking okay. 32 FPS was the 0.1% low figure. That indicates some stutter. Here and there, there was the occasional drop, but Kingdom Come is just one of those games that drops at random intervals it's very very demanding it looks great and it also enjoys some decent processing power and quite a lot of RAM I found 
Metro Exodus, probably one of the best looking games out right now, 65 frames per second on average with the high settings with pretty decent percentile numbers on screen as well. Now, Metro Exodus displays some very rapid changes in frame rate. One moment you may see 90 frames per second and the next you might see 45. It varies so so much. Don't be surprised though if you see significantly different results depending on what level you are playing on. So there we have it, a decent performing gaming PC built inside the chassis of an old Alienware Aurora ALX. Now, would I recommend doing this? Well, if you have a spare Alienware case, it's worth a try, but going out and purchasing an Alienware case isn't a fantastic idea. They can still be very expensive, but it's nice to know that you can hook up all the lights, everything like that will work fine on certain motherboards. The 2600X and 1660 Ti seems to be a pretty good combination these days. If you were to build something similar, may I suggest the 1600 AF instead, as I said before it will perform similar to a 2600 non-X and both of those are still fantastic chips. As for this video, I hope you've enjoyed it, thank you very much for watching, if you did leave a like on it, leave a dislike if you didn't, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and I'll be back with another PC Melter video in the next one.